All right, uh, Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Chapter 11 is Aircraft Performance. So obviously, once we figured out that we're within our weight and balance limitations uh, in the last chapter here, we have to figure out that we have enough performance to take off and land from the runways that we want to take off and land from, and that we have enough uh, fuel and endurance to get from point A to point B. So um, when we uh, do that, um, we'll start with uh, calculating takeoff performance. So in the case of the chief manual, uh, it's very simple here. We just have uh, takeoff performance li distances listed. Now you'll notice this says on a hard, dry runway. So we don't have that. Yeah, if, if the runway, well, in the winter time now with everything frozen, yeah, that's true. That's a, a that, that grass runway is pretty hard. But you know, in the summertime, it might be wet, it might be soft. And those change the numbers, uh, increase the distances somewhat. Um, and uh, you'll notice here we have two ways to choose from. We have gross weight, 1,250 pounds, and uh, 1,000 pounds, which is about a, so, a solo flying weight. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, we calculated 1,227 pounds with the two of us and our average fuel load. So we're actually about halfway in between these two. So we need to do what's called interpolation. So you take two numbers and basically mm -hmm. Uh, go halfway in between them to find what your actual performance is. Well, we're actually closer be. to the 1250. We're only off by a few yeah. pounds from the 12. So, yeah. very little off of there, but it would yeah. be, these, are, these would be pretty close for the, pretty close. the bus and the plane. Pretty close. So, then you have numbers for sea level 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, and 5,000 feet. Well, and what do you know? Brooklyn is exactly 1,000 feet. Yep. So, we can just use that column and know it's pretty yep. close. Yep. So, since we're just under 1,250 pounds, uh, in the chief manual here, we have uh, at 1,250 pounds at 1,000 feet, 601 feet as our ground roll. So, so give or take a few, we're talking 600 feet. About 600 feet. Um, now, in other airplanes, um, you'll notice here um, they have an excerpt from a Cessna manual That's in figure 11-5. 11 1115. 11, I'm sorry, yeah, it's 1115. Um, and on page 11-13. Um, so they have takeoff distance. This looks like it's probably for a Cessna 182 at 3,800 pounds. Um, so they give you some a few more assumptions here. Uh, flaps set to 10 degrees, 2850 RPM, full throttle, uh, cowl flaps open, paved, level, dry runway, and zero wind. So the wind obviously can also affect uh, the uh, takeoff distance. Now, um, the chief manual doesn't actually say this, but most manuals will. So it'll say decrease distances by 10% for each 10 knots of headwind. Uh, for operations with tailwinds of up to 10 knots, increase distances by 10% for each 2.5 knots of tailwind. So taking off with a headwind uh, helps us get off the ground quicker, taking yep. off with a tailwind really hurts us a lot. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Uh, in terms of the amount of distance that we take. So, but So here it says uh, some notes here. So short field technique is specified in section 4, which would be in the Cessna manual. Uh, landing gear extended until the takeoff obstacle is cleared, because this is, looks like it's probably for a Cessna 182RG uh, with retractable landing gear. Uh, where distance value has been uh, deleted, climb performance after liftoff is uh, less than 150 feet per minute. Rate of climb is based on landing gear extended flaps 10 at takeoff speed. So uh, in certain conditions you may have a climb rate of less than 150 feet per minute and they just round that to zero basically is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just talked about with uh, with headwinds, and then they say for operation on a dry grass runway, increase distances by 15% of the ground roll figure only. So uh, then they have, you'll see, it, uh, part of it is cut off, but you can see the columns here. We have weight, um, pressure altitude, so that would be like the altitudes mm -hmm. in the chief manual there, and then at different temperatures they have corrections. Because that adjusts the temperature affects the air density. Correct? Right. So they have it for zero degrees C, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 10 degrees C, which is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees C, 30, 40 C. 
as well in degrees Celsius. Uh, then the, you'll notice they have ground roll and distance to clear a 50-foot obstacle. In the chief manual, we just have the ground roll listed. Um, and we don't even have temperature right. on there. So it's, we have a few data points in the chief, but not nearly as, as right. uh, comprehensive as a modern POH would be. Um, so when we're calculating that, uh, Cessna would have a, uh, a much more extensive table with more rows and columns than we have here. Mm -hmm. Piper likes to use a graph, um, so different manufacturers do it slightly different ways. Um, and then, uh, so for us, we calculated that we had uh, 601 uh, feet uh, to take off. In the chief, so they give a little excerpt here from the chart supplement, uh, showing uh, the runway information, and see here on let's take as an example runway one one right two nine left at this airport that they're using as an example in Denver um, is seven thousand feet long. Now, of course, this is at a much higher altitude. Yeah, you're mile high. Yeah, so you're at five thousand feet. So in the chief manual, that would mean 657 feet takeoff roll, uh, and our runway is 7,000 feet long, so I'd say that's not a problem. Yeah, we're okay. We can landing. We can land long if we need to. Well, that would be takeoff, but yeah. yeah I'm mm -hmm. saying when we landing, we could land yeah. long and oh, yeah. still be okay. They talk a little bit about hydroplaning here, which can be an issue because if you, <clears throat> just like in a car, if you hydroplane, the tires go on top of any yeah, standing scary. water. Scary in a car, I can imagine, in a plane. Yeah, and so they just tell you here that uh, to calculate the speed at which you'll hydroplane, you take oh. 9 and multiply that by the square root of the tire pressure, and that gives you your speed in knots. All right, and so they uh, they give us a way to calculate that uh, hydroplaning speed there with that little formula. Not something I've run into all that often. But have you ever hydroplaned in a plane? Not that I can recall. Uh, a lot of runways have grooves in them to help yep. shed the water and uh, prevent hydroplaning. And um, I've been on some icy runways for sure. Were those scary? <laughs> those get a little interesting, yeah. yeah. But uh, I can't remember the uh, time when I've hydroplaned. Um, now here they show uh, how, how wind affects uh, take off and landing, uh, percent uh, increase in take off or landing distance here, and uh, ratio of wind velocity to uh, take off speed here. That's an basically what the calculation yeah. back here was telling is just putting it in a graph. In, in a so graph, you can visually form. see. Yeah, it. and figure 11 19 there. If you're curious, you can take a look at that and figure it out. But uh, as Philip said, that's basically taking what we said about a page ago and just basically uh, got a headwind, you get up quicker. Yeah. Got a tailwind, you come down a lot quicker. No. Nope. Quicker as in speed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you having to add, in, you come down with a longer rollout. Correct. Much longer. And you take off with a much longer. short. Well, you take off with a headwind. You take off with a short tailwind. You take off with a whole lot longer. Oh yeah. Take off roll. Yep. For sure. Um, so the. The next thing that we would want to calculate on a flight, so we know our takeoff performance, we would want to know our cruise performance. So in the chief manual here, you have uh, power and altitude. So it, all it gives you is 2150 RPM because that's cruise RPM in the chief. Different air, uh, other airplanes might give multiple different power settings. Mm -hmm. This manual only gives you one. We pretty much set it and forget it. Pretty much. So it gives you at sea level, 5,000 feet and 10,000 feet. So at, uh, let's say 5,000 feet, uh, 2150 RPM should give us 92 miles an hour and four gallons per hour uh, fuel burn. So from that we could figure out if we want to go, say, 150 miles um, at 92 miles an hour, uh, that'll take us just over an hour and a half. Yep. And four gallons an hour, an hour and a half, six, or seven gallons, six and a half gallons. 
Now we also, at the end of the flight, we have to have at least a 45 minute reserve. You usually have to have 20 percent. Is it that the rule? 20 percent no. or just 45 minutes? Well, 45 minutes for night. Well, for night, uh, it's required to be 45. Day, it can be 30 minutes, but uh, as my own... Uh, 45 minutes is always a good thing. My own personal preference is to never go below 45. Um, so we need to save about three gallons. Yeah, Le legally two gallons. Yeah. We two, should be landing two, at two about, eight. we should land landing somewhere between yeah. two and three gallons left. Yeah. The dipstick will have very little tape showing. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so landing with at least, you know, two and a half, three gallons is uh, the minimum. So we're, we're flying at 3,000, we're probably burning about four and a quarter gallons an hour. Somewhere yeah, something there. like that, something like that. Um, we went all the way up to 10,000 feet, it might get down a little bit to 3.5. And that's just because the engine is making less power up there. And the air is thinner, so you're going faster. Exactly. Ground speed, but how much gas would it take you to get up there? A oh, fair bit. Yeah, so yeah. you'd probably come back to, you know, as far as total use flight, total fuel usage on that flight, yeah. you'd probably come out even, right? So in, in uh, my airplane, which is a Luscom, uh, which has the same engine as the Chief, um, Last summer, I took off from Broadhead Airport, which is down uh, <coughs> just south of us, south almost to <coughs> Illinois here, and I was flying back home up to uh, airport on the north side of Madison here, where I keep it, and uh, decided to climb up to ten thousand feet. It took me about three quarters of the way from Broadhead up here to get up to ten thousand feet. Wow, it's a pretty slow climb. Yep. And then you just kind of pulled it back and did glide all the way down. Pretty much. <laughs> But that was a well, fun little experiment, a bit. Yeah, and it was August, and it was. Uh, you didn't have to worry about carb heat. It was, and all it that. was about 95 degrees on the ground, so I climbed up to 10,000 feet. Yeah, it was about cool. 40 degrees. <coughs> I bet the air was smooth up there too. Or even less, 30 degrees up there. Yeah, it was pretty smooth. <coughs> so that's our cruise uh, performance. Then landing performance. Once again, we just have just like the takeoff. We just have two lines for a solo weight and dual weight. Sea level 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 foot. <coughs> so around here at 1,000 feet, dual, <coughs> about 462 feet ground roll. <coughs> and again, uh, you'd want to increase that by about 10% uh, for, for each. Two uh, and a half ten, miles. Well, knots. Each, each, ten, each 10 knots of uh, um, headwind and... <coughs> Uh, increase it by 10% for each two and a half knots of tailwind. Of tailwind. <coughs> so Nobody uses chiefs in stole competitions, do they? Because they don't have flaps. I would be pretty uncommon, yeah. And they <coughs> don't have very big engines either. Yeah. Um, so that goes over landing performance. Now, you can also calculate climb performance. The chief climbs maybe four to five hundred feet a minute, so um, if we're going to say cruise at 3,000 feet, we need to climb 2,000 feet. If we're going to climb at an average of about 400, 500 feet a minute, um, that's going to take us a little over four minutes, maybe five minutes <coughs> to climb up to 3,000 feet. And to, the higher we climb, the longer it's going to take us. Because <coughs> it's thinner and we're getting less right. power. And other airplanes will have tables to figure that out specifically. How, how much distance it will take, how much time it will take, how much fuel you, you'll use to get up there, what your rate of climb is going to be, and what speed to use to get up there. So when we're climbing, we're, what, 65, 60? 60-ish. 65, yeah. somewhere, and we cruise at about 85 to 90. Nine, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, we, we, sh we climb and descend at about 60, and we cruise at about 90. So... And that's convenient, too, because 60 miles an hour is a mile a minute. Mm -hmm. 90 miles an hour is a mile and a half a minute. So uh, Easy to calculate. When, when, when you're doing, you know, when you're trying to figure out how long it's going to take you to get somewhere, it makes it real easy to do some calculations <coughs> in your head. It's kind of nice, at least yep. for us first-timers. Yeah. And uh, so this in figure 11-21 uh, here shows a more extensive table for what a uh, takeoff distance chart might look like in a, a this is usually the, the format that Cessna uses. Um, so at 2,400 pounds at maybe their example is 
looks like they're using uh, 2,500 feet, halfway between 2,000 and 3,000, um, and they're saying at, two, at uh, 20 degrees Celsius, they're interpolating between 1,115 feet and 1,230 feet ground roll. So that's going to be about 1,175-ish. Uh, Give or take 1,200 in yeah, the ballpark. Feet to get off the ground in that example that they're using. Um, and uh, you can figure out the pressure altitude uh, by, in this case, they have a little graph here to uh, your actual altitude. So, so let's just figure it out, let's say, for, uh, for Brooklyn. So we're at 1,000 feet, and the temperature has been about, uh, on the Fahrenheit scale, it's been about 30 degrees Fahrenheit at 1,000 at 1,000 feet, so our pressure altitude is actually just over 2,000 feet, according to what this graph is telling us. Showing how that works. So, oh, because this whole line is 2,000 feet. Yep. Oh, okay, I was trying to meet them. And, right. Okay, so we're at 1,000 and we're at about 30 degrees, so it intersects that line. So that's one of those things you have to right. worry about on a really hot, humid day. Yep. Yep. Or if you're up in the mountains. Yep. And you should use, when you're using, <coughs> selecting altitude on this performance chart, you, you go should by use, that. use your density altitude, so about 2,000, yeah, about you calc six, yeah. 619 feet so takeoff we roll. If it was a really hot, humid day and we were 1,500 feet higher, it could hit 5,000 density altitude, and we would want to use that number. Exactly. And this is what Piper uses. I like... A lot of people call this a chase around chart because it's <laughs> <laughs> it makes your eyes hurt trying yeah. to figure out what you're so doing. So you have to go up one. here and across here and down at an angle and across and down at an angle again and across and up at an angle. Um, again, Piper likes to use charts that look like that. Um, a lot of transport aircraft, airliners and stuff use charts like that. And um, they get the job done, but they're kind of a pain in the ass to use. So They look like a mess. Yeah. Although in my reading, I did figure that out at one point in time when I was reading over that. I took the time, yeah. and, and if you go through the example and look at the figure, yeah, then it, it, it starts it, to it, make it, a little it does, bit of sense. It does start to make sense. It starts to make a little bit of sense. Um, and something else they have in here is a nice little chart to calculate crosswind components. So figure 10-31, so if... Uh, down at Brooklyn, let's say we have a wind out of 360 at 20 knots, mm -hmm. pretty strong wind, and the runway is 31, so it's 310. So it's a 50 degree crosswind at 20 knots. So how, what's our crosswind component? So 50 degrees at uh, 20. 20, and you follow that down, that's about a 16, 17 knot crosswind component. Oh, down this way. Yeah. So... In their example, they used a 30 degree at 25 knots, which... So, in, in our example from Brooklyn, 50, yep. 50 degree crosswind at 20 knots, yep. you can and you said 16 components. So, that would be like yeah, a 16 like, mile an hour headwind calculation. That would be 16 crosswind. If you follow it the other way, you get headwind. Oh, okay. So, if, if we go 50 degrees... 20, uh, 20 knots and follow it across, that's about uh, 13 knots of headwind and 16 knots crosswind. So you would calculate your landing distance with the headwind component, component of that. Correct. So the crosswind component, how does that affect the stuff? Uh, Airplanes will often have a maximum demonstrated crosswind capability. Which okay, it it's factors in what you're able to do with the right. plane as far as landing. Like right. the last time we went flying, it was pretty windy. Yeah. If that was a crosswind, we wouldn't have been flying probably. Probably not, no. And different but Because it was almost right down the runway. Different could. airplanes will have different... And, and <clears throat> most air, for most airplanes, the crosswind is not a limitation. It, you'll it's notice a, it says... a strong suggestion. It, ma it says maximum demonstrated which is the most they have tested it to in the, pro in the certification process. You can land with more crosswind than that, and there have been times in certain airplanes where I certainly have. Uh, it certainly, certainly can be done. But uh, 
there's so there's two components to the maximum demonstrated crosswind capability. Um, that is a the strongest crosswind that they were able to find to test the airplane, mm -hmm. and b in most cases it's also the str it it can be the strongest crosswind at which you can touch down with no crosswind correction and not damage the landing gear. Yeah, that would make sense because you can come in down and it's pushing you. It right. puts a lot of stress on the, the plane. Right. And certainly for, tr for airliners, for transport airplanes, they are required to be able to land at their maximum demonstrated crosswind component in a crab without using the rudder and just slam the gear on and not have the gear collapse. That's not the kind of landing you want to be. It's not the kind of landing you want to do, but the airplane has to be able to withstand it if it happens. So we've talked about the cruise perform the takeoff performance, the landing de the performance, the cruise performance, the crosswind, and that pretty much concludes chapter 11 on aircraft performance.